I'm absolutely delighted uh, to welcome back Brian Beatty. Um, Brian is known to you, I think all of you, as the inventor of the term high flex, the first great theoretician of what it means. He's also a professor at San Francisco State University where he manages somehow to both support faculty, to consult worldwide, and to teach all the time and look incredibly calm while doing so. Uh, we've had him as a guest before. He's been a terrific, terrific person, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome him back. Brian, glad to see you here. Welcome. Well, thank you, Brian, for inviting me back again. I always enjoy being hosted by someone with the same front first name, even though it's spelled a little differently. Uh, but it has been a kind of a wild ride, especially the last six months, both returning to faculty and kind of uh, helping a lot of other people think about what HyFlex means and what, what it can offer them as they kind of consider how they're going to kind of are currently kind of grappling with the situation we all find ourselves in. So, Sure. Well, uh, you're the world's guru for this right now. Um, it's got to be uh, um, enormously exciting and uh, a bit daunting at times. Yeah, definitely, and and uh, there are th th there are a lot of others who've been doing uh, this mode or modes just like it, calling it something else for quite a number of years. And I know they're they've been very gracious with their time too to help their colleagues, uh, both inside their institutions and outside. And I know some of them are here in the audience today, so hopefully they'll get a chance to share some of their stories too. Oh, great! Well, I'm 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 just really really glad to hear it, um, and we're honored by your time. Just a, a quick question. I, I don't like to ask people to introduce themselves because as academics, that can go on for a while. What I normally do is ask them what people are going to be working on. And from what I can tell, for the next year, you're going to be high flex all the time. Uh, you're going to be teaching in it and advising people on how to do it. Is that right? Yeah, I'm, I'm re-engaging in my uh, teaching side of my higher, higher education academic career. Uh, and very excited about that and doing kind of what I call online high flex now because we're not allowed in the classroom. So that's that's and our, can't, our 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 system just decided to do this again in the spring, and I guess we'll see what happens next fall. So there's that whole that whole thing. Uh, the other thing we're doing is we're working on uh, you know more support resources around high flex. The, the, this open access book that's available free online's been out since October. That's getting a lot of uh, attention, but uh, there's there there is a, a real need for more and. A lot of uh, individual institutions have faculty development centers and other places like that that can provide quite a bit of a support. Uh, but I think there's a there's a need for another kind of a general resource area, kind of a community site. And so we're working hard to kind of design that and start building it so that it's ready to go to support people, especially as they start working uh, on their plans for spring and uh, get prepared over the winter uh, for whatever spring holds for us. Whatever spring holds up for us is quite a question. Uh, just, just a couple of quick notes before we go further. Uh, people have been asking me. Um, the um, first of all, the uh, open access ebook. You should find a link to it if you look in the bottom of your screen. On the left side, there's a kind of tan orange colored box that says "Hybrid Flexible Course Design." If you click that, that'll take you to the uh, to the ebook. Uh, and again, thank you, uh, Brian, uh, for making that uh, available. Uh, a few folks have had uh, audio problems. Just refreshing this page usually does the trick. It seems to have helped uh, more than a few times. Um, and one more point, uh, Nick and a couple others have asked, are we recording this? We are recording this, and it'll be up on YouTube uh, as soon as possible. That usually means tomorrow morning or so. Uh, thank you for doing that. Um, and um, hello to everyone else who's just piled in. We have almost 200 folks in here, and I'm glad to see you. If you're new to the forum, um, I do very little in the way of actually asking you my own questions. I'm the MC here, so I'm, my job is to convey your questions. And before I can even say that, we already have questions. We have one from a Monroe Community College professor, uh, Sherry Chibangu, and let me just bring her up on stage right now. Hello, Professor Chibangu. No, I didn't mean to come on stage. Oh. I was clicking buttons. <laughs> no problem. No I'm problem. just here to learn. And no. uh, yeah, I've been clicking buttons. And so, no, get me uh, off stage, please. No problem. No problem. Well, welcome I'm, to the stage anyway, right? I'm, I'm glad to see you. If it's uh, Monroe in New York State, I'm especially glad to hear you. Um, so um, everybody else, if you have questions, you see how easy it is to pop on stage, just click the raised hand button. And the video works just like that. And if you want to do text instead, uh, just type in something into the question box. Um, and we'd be glad, glad to hear from you. Um, in fact, uh, I think we've had a couple of questions uh, that are already starting to come in. Um, and uh, the first one is one that, Brian, I, I've heard this from a lot of people, in fact. Um, and this has to do with the question of equity. 
Um, mm -hmm. How do you see high flex playing out in terms of, uh, of, of equity? That is people who have uneven access either to the physical classroom or to right. different online technologies. Yeah, that's a great question. That's something that um, we've been really talking about lately. Uh, as a matter of fact, we did some work with uh, colleagues uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on a white paper sponsored by a Canadian organization. Uh, and that was, a, that was a main theme of it, was supporting equity in this time of, uh, you know, kind of, uh, to use an overused term, unprecedented uh, disruption in our educational system. And I think what it's done is revealed a lot of uh, uh, it's revealed inequities. Maybe we didn't realize we're there or we're as as uh, as critical as they are. But we're finding that you know every single mode we're talking about here and in the high flex uh, conversation, we're usually talking about you know two main modes in the classroom or online, and oftentimes the synchronous and the asynchronous online. So we're really kind of talking about three modes. And so we've really had to be become pretty um, pretty cognizant of the the fact that every single one of those modes has inequities kind of inherent in the design or or you know the the whole aspect of it in the classroom. We know we can't serve all students who need access to uh, education. Actually, whatever level it is, uh, either because they can't get there, right, or um, uh, for whatever reason, or they don't have the time available. And so, in higher ed, we've known about this for a long time, which is why we have all these online programs. A, a one main reason, obviously, is to provide access to students who couldn't be there for face-to-face -face programs. Uh, but we're also finding now, especially even in our our K-12 systems, our students can't get to the classroom now. Uh, mm -hmm. Because they they are some a lot of times they're precluded from coming because of uh, social distancing requirements or they're in quarantine or they don't feel safe or their parents don't feel safe so there needs to be something for them beyond the classroom and and, and in many cases uh, you know there are issues of equity around that even at that uh, you know kind of the lower the younger levels not really lower levels but younger levels but when we move to the online world you know I I talk about designing for asynchronous first well designing for an asynchronous environment. If that's done with a relatively weak pedagogy, there are there are in, in, inherent inequities built into that because they typically end up with a less engaging environment. Well, the studies I've seen and that I've worked with some doctoral students on, I have shown that those inequities are 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 worse. The grade differential between um, you know st oftentimes students of color and and, and uh, you know white and Asian students as a group, right, underrepresented minorities and uh, mm -hmm. and others. That difference, which is which is problematic in the classroom, ten or twelve percent maybe in some places, but it's often double online in those mm -hmm. asynchronous online environments, especially in the larger ones. And so there are issues of design that are that um, you know kind of kind of come out in this idea of online asynchronous environment, relatively easy to build online, but more challenging to facilitate an engaged environment, and it's harder to have that relationship. These ideas of presence online are really critical at this point. Uh, and when we don't address those well, we end up with inequities there. We may provide students with access to education that way, uh -huh. but if there's a 20 or 30 percent, you know, uh, in the literature and on your in your databases in many of your courses, you might find this. Uh, that's a, that's a basically a systemic inequity right there. Yeah. Right now, we move to the synchronous environment, which most of us have done across the board at least for a few months in in the spring, and many are continuing now. The predominant form is still uh, synchronous online learning that I see at least. There are inequities built in there because of the access to the technology. For one thing, the, the bandwidth, just the network itself, the technology to use well at, at, at home or in another environment, and just having a home environment that's conducive to a study or like a work or a workplace. And so, so if we, you know, in my opinion, if we, if we end up with just a single mode in any one of these, we're gonna disadvantage a group of students um, and we've been doing that all along whenever we've done kind of single mode access. And so that's my real, that's my long term kind of hope for this is that we can, we can address some of these issues of systemic inequity by providing different forms of access to the kind of the same, the same experience, the same courses, the same learning community, the same learning outcomes. Uh, it's not, it's not easy. It's challenging. But I think in the long run, we'll find when we look carefully at what we're doing, we will be able to much better serve you know, the broad part of our, our, our society that really needs the kinds of things that we can offer. Well, that's a, that's that's a rich answer. That's a rich answer. You covered a lot of ground, especially the uh, uh, thinking about the inequities uh, over asynchronous versus synchronous. That's vital, very important. Uh, we had yeah, we're, we're, we're having an internal debate on our campus and our faculty about which which form of online, we're all doing, almost all doing online education right now, but but there are elements within our organization that say, well, we should be doing asynchronous because of the inequities we see in the synchronous environment. And then there are other elements that know the data around asynchronous performance 
uh, and the lack of engagement that's often designed into these courses and say, well, that's disadvantaging students as well. So we should be focused on synchronous. So, you know, my contribution is, well, we're disadvantaging people a little differently. It's often the same group that's disadvantaged. Yes. So if we offer, if we're able to offer both, if we can design for both and support both and prepare people for both, we end up having a lot fewer overall students who end up in where they have no choice, you know, or where they're disadvantaged in both ways. It's, it's, a, it's a smaller group of students, still not ideal. We do need the classroom too, of course. That's a powerful finding and a powerful strategy. Uh, we had a couple of remarks in the chat box I just wanted to pass on. Sherry Purpose uh, says that uh, she has found that more challenging than access to devices and Wi-Fi has been a place to learn as their homes are small with many people. Good right. point, Sherry. Um, and Nicole says, uh, as a learning community, she means staff, teachers, parents, admin, students, we can demand reallocation of funds, e.g. from investments in private prisons to technology access. That's a good politics. Um, we have a whole bunch of comments about this. Uh, Tanya Justin has a question. Uh, she'd like to see the research on asynchronous creating inequity from lower reported engagements. Sure, I can share that with you, Tanya. Great. It's an internal, well, like like some of us have internal reports. It's an internal uh, report on gray data from our uh, our campus from a, uh, about a year and a half ago. Thank you for that. And uh, mm -hmm. good question. Tanya is a wonderful, wonderful uh, mm -hmm. researcher and a great person to know. So if you're not following her on Twitter, go do it. Tanya is amazing. Uh, we have a question, a video question. Uh, it comes from Fort Lewis College. This is from Jennifer Ryder. Let's bring Jennifer up on stage. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Beautifully. Mm -hmm. Hi, Brian and Brian. I think I'm, this is my first shindig event. I think I'm terrified to be on stage in front of 188 people, mainly because I have a million questions for Brian. So um, I'm going to try and doing? narrow it down to one. Okay. I'll give you about 30 seconds of context of our institution. Um, it's about 3,500 students. It's in, in a, a Native American serving institution. We have over 50% students of color. Mm -hmm. We're one of two institutions in the U.S. that offers 100% free tuition for Native American students. Um, and so we've had challenges in the past of, of student access, students coming from rural communities, um, students needing to leave for care of family members or ceremonies or things like that. So HyFlex has been on my radar for a while. I'm the director of teaching and learning. And so I, mm -hmm. I try and invest in, in things like this that can help our institution. We have a pilot going this fall of 10 faculty doing HyFlex courses after learning about this model, um, and then and then COVID hit, and we um, have kind of seen everybody doing high flex today in our mm -hmm. teaching and learning committee. Um, my team said everyone's really doing a form of high flex. Mm -hmm. So I think my question is, how do you advise a small institution to to adopt the high flex model, which is what our goal is to adopt it um, as a formal model of instruction without overwhelming the faculty? So mm -hmm. right now we've got high flex synchronous asynchronous students saying, well, I understand you're allowing me to come synchronously, but I'd like the recording, please. I need it because of this. And so students are advocating mm -hmm. more for their needs. Faculty are feeling. I feel like we're at this point where we need to maybe reel it back to be successful and start small. And so what recommendations might you have um, to make sure that this is successful so faculty don't go, wait a minute, this is more than I ever thought mm -hmm. it was. Well, th thank you for the question. I think that's an excellent question. It's actually one of the things I wrote down is to to uh, talk a little bit about uh, if I had the opportunity, whether it came up in a question or not. But the way this has been done well in the past, from my experience, uh, and I'm going to ask uh, one or two people in the audience here to tell their story too, because I know they have a good story here, uh, is that it's not it doesn't it's if it's if it's coming top down like the the institutions making a strategic decision to do this. That it takes it takes a couple of years, really, to kind of pi to come up with a conception. What works for us? Why are we doing it? Get that why clear, and get a small group of faculty trying it out. Maybe it's a, a single area, uh, or maybe it's uh, you know uh, faculty from across different areas. But it, you have a, a, a manageable approach, right? A pilot environment, and then as that has success, and if it has success, to expand that, like you would with a lot of other kinds of things. But that's a two to three year process, probably at least. Like like most things worth doing in higher education, it takes a couple of years to get something off the ground like that. 
Um, what's happening now, and we've all experienced this, especially when you when you hear high flex in the news these days, it's really usually I see it's coming from really two different places. One, it's administrations or or universities putting out public relations releases saying, "Hey, we're going to better serve our students this semester by offering this high flex model, which often isn't even high flex, but it's it's like a multimodal model uh, that kind of meets their specific needs." But there's no, there's never any talk from the faculty saying, "Hey, yeah, you know, we're bought into this and we're going to do this well." What we hear from faculty then is usually the pushback, said, "Hey, they're telling us we have to do this." And one, I don't want to be in the classroom, or two, I, they're not giving me any time or support to learn how to do this. They're just expecting me to do this because, because they made this decision. And so that's what we hear. We don't hear the stories where it's actually working well. Hopefully, there's some of those out in the crowd. Um, but to actually to talk about specifics, I wonder if I can recruit uh kathy kathy littlefield to tell her story because she comes from she could tell but a small school that made a strategic decision to do this and took a multiple year process to do this so maybe kathy if you're willing would you come up on stage and kind of share a little bit about your the approach you took at uh, pierce college i can i can bring She's her still up here let me see if uh see if i, I, I wonder i might ask her to come up with us good hello professor littlefield she might be frozen. Her connection might be slow. Um, while, while she's coming up, I'll also say I just recently heard about uh, a story from the University of the Southwest in Hobbs, New Mexico. I think it was an Inside Higher Ed. They had a, a podcast uh, that went, was going on this week. Um, and, and it was the provost of that talking about how they made a strategic choice to adopt HyFlex to, to address some enrollment issues they were having. Uh, and they took, a, once again, they took a multi-year process to do this well, to get faculty buy-in. And to provide the supports they needed, and to and, and to and then and then to um, you know watch how it was doing and do some evaluation. They found that for them it really worked well. They had I think they said they quadrupled their enrollment, a small school you know in you know rural I guess desertish almost uh, New Mexico, uh, private school. So um, very concerned about that. So they but they also took a multi-year approach uh, to kind of you know, build, build, build this idea that we're doing this because the institution needs us and it's going to be good for students. And we're not just going to throw you into this. We're going to prepare you faculty to, to, so you can do this well. Hi, Kathy. I see you made Hi. it through. Here I am. I didn't know how to get up there. That's kind of interesting. My first shindig too. So this is good. Welcome. Um, thanks for the tip off and for a great question. So a little bit of background about who Pierce College is. We are in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, we have a rich history dating back to 1865 but we are a small nonprofit, non-residential institution serving um, primarily minorities. And we have always been dealing with adult learners. Uh, we have always been on the cutting edge in the 80s. We were one of the first to go with fully online and all of that. And we had, we came into High Flex kind of organically. And then all of a sudden I met Brian at a conference. I'm like, oh my God, you're the High Flex guy. This is what we're doing. And it turned out that we were doing High Flex and we didn't even know it. Um, we have been four years now into integrating high flex. We call it Pierce Fit, and we offer it as a flexible learning opportunity for the students, where the students have the chance to go fully online for the week or in person for the week. And the reason we initiated high flex for Pierce, it had to do with being able to offer um, healthy course enrollments. And what we found is we had some sections that were fully online some were fully on campus and there weren't quite enough to run individual courses. So a couple faculty members and we got together and we said, well, what can we do? Well, let's see if we can combine them into one, have one course section that had a healthy enrollment and then we can divvy it up, you know, how they wanna participate online or on campus. So we did a pilot with this and we, we initiated it with our graduate studies division, which was small, it was just starting at the time and our health programs. So the faculty chair of the health program, Stephanie Donovan and I took this on for our two areas and we, we tested it and the students loved it. They loved being able to decide this week, am I going to be able to be in class or am I gonna be marked absent? Uh, we run accelerated courses, so courses are every seven weeks. And what we found is that we've had students that would tell us, you know, my husband is a firefighter. He doesn't get his schedule out, but four weeks in advance. And I never know if he can cover the children. So I have to take the course online, but I'm really a better learner on campus. So our Pierce Fit model was perfect for students like that. 
So how did we do this? We took it to the provost, we took it to the president and the president jumped on board immediately. So we became a top down deployment of this. Um, it became a strategic initiative because we were looking at a way to improve uh, retention, improve attendance, and we saw improvements with both of those. And we've got some statistics, if anybody wants them, I can share that out, or it's in that chapter in the book that Brian um, talked about a little bit earlier. So our first year of the high flex model, this was after we brought Brian to campus and kind of tucked some of the faculty off the ledge of what he'd have us do. And, and they, they accepted it. After hearing it from Brian, they accepted it. Uh, we ran the first full year of converting all of the courses in graduate studies and health programs to this model. The second year, we went across the curriculum and every other program went with this model. So we didn't do it on a voluntary basis. We did it across the board, every course, with the exception of maybe a few developmental courses or some of the law courses that had to be on campus because of ABA. So year two, across the curriculum. Year three, our LMS changed and we went to Canvas. So we had three years of mind blowing, faculty were ready to revolt on all of this because we had another change come our way. Um, everything happened fine. We got Canvas up and running, everything was good. And then COVID hit. And March 13th, we had the same situation that everybody else had. Our campus was closed. The city of Philadelphia was shut down. What do you do? It was simple for us. All we did is we took our courses that were already developed on campus and online within the same shell, and we shut down the on-campus piece. So then everybody became an online learner. We didn't have any, any hiccups along the way, except for maybe a couple students who had technology issues because other children were using that one computer that they had because everybody was online at the same time. Minimal little things like that. Um, what we found was that the students were happy with it, but there was still that small percentage that wanted to hear our voices and see our faces and we wanted to hear their voices and faces. So we added as of the fall, a required synchronous element to it. It's required for faculty, but it's optional for students. So we took our high flex from being on campus or online to being synchronous or asynchronous, all in the same shell. And it has been really successful, but we did the, the synchronous piece because the students wanted that. Um, and we have a 90 minute requirement. And I will tell you that for the last two, three weeks, I've gone way over that 90 minutes and the students haven't balked one bit. And as you can tell, I can talk a lot. So it's not hard for me to go on and on and on. But it, but it was really successful and it has helped us with attendance and it has helped us with retention. Has it increased enrollment? I don't know whether anything can be attributed to where enrollments are because of where we are as a society. Um, but our enrollments have not declined, which probably is a big thing in higher ed right now. Kathy, can I ask, so prior to requiring the synchronous meetings, all your faculty on campus were offering these high flex courses as asynchronous, meaning the two pathways were either in person or a fully built out online course. Did mm -hmm. that require, what did that look like for your institution to move all the courses to build them online? I'm thinking about we stipend faculty for online course design. Yeah, what does that's that a great question. That's a great question. So we gave every faculty member a course release uh, for the fall term and a course release for the spring term to convert their courses. And we run under a model of course coordinators. So as a course coordinator, you might be responsible for eight or 10 courses. So we had already online sections and on campus sections built. The coordination came to how do we combine them now into one shell? So even though it sounds like that's not much of a course release, they weren't really redesigning, they were merging the two into one course shell. And at the time we were with eCollege and then of course we switched over to Canvas. Um, but, but the course releases helped. It was still a lot of work. Um, it took a lot of training. Uh, we had a lot, of, a lot of faculty meetings that were working sessions where we could meet our deadlines because we all had deadlines that we had to go by. Um, some of them we missed a few of the deadlines but we made up for it. Um, Oh. But but the course releases really helped a lot with the with the workload. That's helpful. Thank you. Sure. Oh, Thanks, Kathy. Oh. Yeah. So so there's a few key things there, right? Uh, the strategic decision, mm -hmm. uh, the buy-in, uh, the resources and support for faculty doing the work, uh, and the time it takes to do it well, as well as responding to the needs expressed and perceived of students. Uh, and I think that's really one of the things that's really contributed to their success, as well as the success of 
uh, some other institutions that have been doing this well for a number of years. Um, it's much harder to do this, obviously, when you're kind of thrown into the thrown it's thrown at you without any planning, just like anything else would be. Why why would we expect it to be any different? So Great. thanks, Kathy. Sure, anytime. Well, thank you very much, Professor Littlefield. Um, You're welcome. And we have a whole stack of, of people who have more and more questions coming. I want to make sure they get a chance. Jennifer, did we uh, did we help address thank your question? Thank you. Yes. Kick me off stage. Well, we're <laughs> glad that you we're glad that you made it here. Welcome, welcome to your first one. Yeah, thank thanks you. for the question. Uh, we have a, a question from uh, Mathieu Plourde uh, at Université Laval. Um, hey there. There he is. Oh, a bunch of Brian's here. Okay, cool, cool. So, um, yeah, so my name is Mathieu Plourde. I work at Université Laval. I used to work at the University of Delaware. Um, 12 years in the U.S. Now I'm back in Canada. Not a moment too soon. Anyway, um, my question was, uh, anytime that you get a mixed bag of learners in a synchronous environment, either face-to-face -face or remote, I feel like the, uh, the AV in the classroom is never good enough to actually carry the voice of everybody. It's like, mm -hmm. even like when you're in meetings with other people, like for your job or whatever, and there's some people in a, in a meeting room and other people are joining in remotely, I feel like there's always that disconnect that the person who's actually remote is actually somebody who's being kind of a second class citizen in mm -hmm. that uh, environment. So I was wondering if you had any tips regarding this to make sure that we actually, because uh, it feels like you're almost better off just having everybody on their computer, even if they're in the classroom so that they can actually interact with the live mm -hmm. session or whatever is happening. So why do you even need them in that, in that room, you know, in that physical room together at all? <laughs> You know, that's a great question, Matthew. Thank you for the question uh, uh, and welcome from across the border. That's still closed, I understand. Um, that, that question actually came up. One of the faculty I worked with in our College of Education was teaching Hyplex. Just he's heard about it, new faculty come in and said, hey, I'd like to do this for my students because I know it's hard for them to get here. So she was doing online uh, and her online was synchronous. So she had students in the classroom and student singers. After she did that for a year, she said, guess what? I don't see the value of having the students in the class. There's really nothing we can't we we're doing in the classroom we can't do with the synchronous crowd and I and for her she said I think it'll be better for me to focus on just one mode so I'm going to just going to do it all synchronous online and it didn't disadvantage her students because they were all able to join that way uh, already and so she moved completely into a synchronous online environment for that exact reason um, yeah. I think for for me I I, I found that I don't want to get rid of the classroom component because enough of my students uh, always come to class. Uh, you know, usually up to half of the students are always in the class. And so I know there's a value there. Sometimes it's a necessity, but oftentimes a value that they, they want and they need that. And so I'm going to continue to try to offer that. So but to manage the synchronous versus or in class versus online, that just I think there's two things. One, the technology does have to support uh, maybe not excellent quality video or audio and video from the classroom, but it's got to be good enough so that anyone who's online can hear what's going on in the classroom. We've come to finally got a solution where we distribute mics around the classroom, and that works very well for us. Uh, but in the early days, this was the thing that was our biggest problem. And when we asked students, they loved the flexibility, they loved the convenience, but when they were working online or trying to listen to a recording as an asynchronous learner, if we provided that for them, that was the one thing that they always talked about was, well, if I can't hear, it's yeah. no good to me. So, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, that's uh, th that's a problem. So. So that's part of it. But the other part about not letting the students online feel like they're second class students is to intentionally engage in the class uh, with the online students as well as the students in the classroom. And that's primarily uh, the, the responsibility, I think, of the instructor to make sure happens, even though the instructor isn't always the one has to, who has to always do the engaging. In the classes I teach where I have students online synchronously and in the classroom, I always encourage students in the classroom, if they've got a device and they want to do it, to also log into the synchronous environment. And so what they do then is what Brian is doing now for us is he's monitoring the chat. He's bringing questions up. He's, he's telling me when, or they're telling me mm -hmm. when comments are being made or they're, they're just having their own conversations in the back channel of the chat or maybe some other technologies I'm not aware of, um, but that happens that way. And then uh, when we do class breakouts, depending upon the numbers of students involved, sometimes we'll have class breakouts that include students with technology in the classroom, with students in the online environment. Yeah. That doesn't always work well, and it's not that well for works well for all students. So sometimes we'll have classroom-only groups as well as online-only groups. 
I'm not too concerned about interaction in that because they're interactive environments themselves. But then mm -hmm. on me, my job is to make sure that when I'm doing some sort of interactive discussion, calling on students, looking for student input, that I'm intentionally including the online students and not just letting them be kind of off to the side, maybe behind me on the screen or things like that. There are some yeah. institutions that put in some extra screens in their rooms where they're teaching in high flex so that so that the students who are online synchronous are visible to the faculty and probably to the other students all the time. That that approach can certainly work well. It, yeah. I mean, it requires more investment. It's a little more complicated. Uh, but that's another way of, of, of supporting that that process. Right. Yeah, I think you can have something like that, right? Like a wall of of cameras of uh, participants. I don't remember what their room looks is called, but they have something like that where they can just teach from, you know, different rooms and whatever and have all these faces on. Yeah, there's a couple of pretty high technology solutions that are actually uh, one or two of them are, out, are, are in the book and the, the case studies. Um, a lot of times they do that for research perspective mm -hmm. too, to see, well, what do we have to do? The whole blend sync literature, you know, from uh, the Australian project is great uh, to talk about how effective those approaches can be. What I found in my work at my campus, I, I, I don't think I could ever get them to spring for a, a room like that. Uh, and probably most of our schools couldn't. But the principles that they're bringing out, I think, are, are incredibly important for us to, to know a little bit about and to see how we can then apply them maybe with less technology. Yeah. Right? Maybe it doesn't take a $50,000 investment to do something that is engaging to students in both modes at once. Yeah. One of the things that, um, that I had my, one of my previous employer buy was a mic ball. So I know that for a while, like people were talking about these things, just mm -hmm. a, it's a ball that you just throw in the room. Throw around, yeah. Catches it. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's kind of silly, but at the same time, I feel like that could be like, if it works well, sometimes it's just a disconnect because it's Bluetooth or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, I feel like that, you know, there, there's something that can be done in that, um, in that sense. Um, I know that, um, you know, the way that I teach my class, so I teach a class for the University of South Florida, and one of the things I do for attendance for live sessions, and it's a fully distance class, but is I just give my students all their points at the beginning of the semester. So there's six points for attendance, whatever. If you miss a class, I don't care. You don't even have to tell me. If you miss two, then I'll remove a point from your bank, and I'll ask you to watch the recording and send me two sentences about what you've learned and, or a question you have. Hmm. So I just want to make sure that they actually stay engaged with the live session. But it's kind of a way to, um, to kind of avoid if somebody really has a conflict and can't attend hmm. that live session, they can still take the class and do something hmm. with it. You know? Do you give them the point back when they get, send yeah, you the I two sentences? the point back as soon as they get okay, right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Was a little you don't shave off 10%, right? Yeah. 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 Well, we have some some of our faculty who teach high flex also, even in our program, have I, uh, like to emphasize the synchronous component. They don't mind having sync. They don't they don't mind teaching in class and synchronous online. They don't want to have students teach. Uh, they don't want to have to support students in the asynchronous because the way they're teaching, it's much more. In, they're they're naturally more engaging in a live environment. And just a recording of that, they know, and you know, I think we all know, it's not nearly uh, the same as being there. Is mm -hmm. it enough to help students reach learning outcomes? I'd argue in most cases, yes. Uh, but it doesn't it doesn't give them the same experience. And so when the experience becomes one of the, one of the important outcomes from a faculty perspective, then oftentimes I found that you'll emphasize the synchronous uh, and, and let the asynchronous kind of be there as a backup to the backup to the backup. You know, only if you have to uh, kind of do that. Still, it's still better than just being out of class for a week or maybe two weeks and not having anything, anything content related interaction to do or facilit facilitated discussions or things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Mathieu, thank you for the great question, and please uh, enjoy being to the north. Um, let us know <laughs> when, it's, when it's okay to visit you, or when you can come back to visit us. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Um, and again, Brian, thank you for that meticulous answer. It is so, so helpful. Friends, we have a stack of questions, and uh, we're running out of time. Um, so I'm going to try to uh, smoosh a few of these together um, based on where they've come from. And I think some of you who have put in text questions may have seen answers already. Um, but let me bring up one right now. This is from uh, Ellen Nuffer. She uh, teaches in uh, New Hampshire, but she's coming to us from the great state of Vermont. Uh, and she asks um, about uh, universal design for learning. Uh, what are the links between HyFlex and UDL? Yeah, thanks for the question. That's a really that's a really important question too. We we started uh, on our campus. We've been talking about UDL for you know for for probably a, as long as it's been kind of a thing. Uh, a, a, you know, a recognition of the need for this as a way of uh, usually through the through the lens of accessibility and providing 
fully accessible environments for all of our students by design as opposed to by accommodation. And in you know, in the, in the language is all in the message to faculty as well. If we design for accessibility uh, and follow these principles, we're also designing for better learning for all of your students. Why? Because some of them, you know, learn a lot better from different forms of, of representation of the content that you're providing, as well as are much a better better fit for different forms of representing what they know. Right. So the the idea of assessment options and things like that, or authentic assessments, which are all kind of uh, you know engaged in the the UDL. Uh, kind of principles uh, as well. So I think it's critical when I when I do faculty workshops uh, around HyFlex. When we start talking about course design and content, uh, that's the first thing I take them to is let's talk about UDL and uh, let's let's review these principles because I want to frame everything we talk about after that. How do we develop content? How do we develop assessment approaches? How do we engage learners? You know, through this lens of of UDL as in options for students. You know, different forms of representing information and assessment and things like that. Uh, they're not just good to support multiple modes of engagement and multiple modes of participation, which they do, um, but they're also good for students learning, right? And for the all overall kind of the teaching process. So in in the in, in the kind of the higher the bigger picture on this was if you're going to give them uh, an in-class experience and then an online experience and maybe two different online experiences, there's going to be some differences in the activities that you do there around content acquisition, but also often around assessment uh, and certainly around engagement. By giving them those different activities, you're kind of designing in a, a UDL-like approach uh, because then they, they have some options to choose among those. Uh, and in my case, I, also, I, I use asynchronous discussions for all my students, even if they're in class. We, do, we, we take the time and part of their homework to prepare for the next class is to engage in an asynchronous discussion because mm -hmm. because of the different form of discussion and just because the discourse is different the thinking is different um it's a different experience for them and i want them to experience that as part of part of their learning you know their their critical inquiry into the class and the topics so yes udl uh you know as a one of the one of the major uh lenses that i use to kind of uh, talk about designing this through um, that's Ellen, a great question thank you, thank you for the question and uh, uh nick um you also had a question about that and i hope this uh, uh i hope this is a good answer for you um, and thank you, Brian. Uh, for this. We have a, um, a very detailed question from uh, Professor Denise Roy at uh, Mitchell Hamline School of Law. And let me just bring this up about small groups. I'm interested in how small groups work with choice to participate mm -hmm. synchronously or not class to class. I prefer preformed small groups that work together to build relationships over a number of weeks. Yeah, that's a great uh, question. I'm actually, uh, I do this in most of my classes, I have some sort of a group project that they work on for a number of weeks, sometimes a whole semester. Uh, and one of the challenges uh, I'm, I'm relearning or re-experiencing as the faculty again, uh, is when I have uh, half the students coming up in a synchronous session live, now we're not in classroom, so live synchronous, and the other students just doing it asynchronously. And so what, what happens, you know, to get a group started is a little more difficult because they're not always synced up on their communication, their synchronicity of their communication, as well as the mode they prefer to participate, communicate in. If they're all coming together synchronously in the classroom or online, not so much of a problem because there's a, there's a media there, either the class or the online media that they can, you can use class time to have them kind of get together and figure that out. Uh, to get them started though, uh, I found that it's been a little more complicated because even our LMS now doesn't show everyone else the other student emails. Some show up, some show down, some don't show up. Cool. So I found that coordination element to get them started better. Now I, I'm teaching, uh, you know, we're teaching adults uh, in higher education. And so I don't have a problem with kind of forcing the long-term coordination of the project on them, but I let them know that I'm here to facilitate. If they're having any issues, they'll let me know and I can kind of help them through this process. I also let them know all the resources we use for the class, including the live class uh, link for them to use for virtual meetings is always available to them as well. And so they can always rely on the class media, whatever it happens to be, uh, to do some of that coordination to get started. Uh, but they're, you know, they're working adults, and so they have to be able to coordinate their own schedule. That's part of what they're learning, you know, kind of the unwritten curriculum is learning how to work while on a team. Does it always work perfect? Absolutely not, right? I've never had a group project as a facilitator, actually, or as a student that was <laughs> perfect, uh, but they always find a way to make it work through. And yeah, so no, no silver bullet there, but... Um, Oh, it's a good question. Thank you for asking, and uh, uh, a really good uh, candid answer. Uh, we have another question uh, from uh, SUNY College. Uh, this is from Susan Werner, 
uh, who asks, if an institution charges different cost credit hour for a campus versus online course, where does HyFlex sit in terms of charging students? And if no difference, what about technology fees? Yeah, that's a good question. Yes. Uh, well, Susan, from my experience uh, in my institution, uh, we don't charge technology fees per se for any students. Uh, and we don't charge differentially in, for uh, online courses compared to face-to-face -face courses. We do have a few programs that charge differential fees, but it's the, for the whole program, not, not dependent upon the type of course it is. And so for us, when we teach HyFlex, we don't really have a structure to, to do anything differently about that. Uh, there are some institutions, you know, the real challenge comes in, well, if, our, if we are choosing dis differential fees, what do we choose for a HyFlex course? Right, because students could show up all the time on campus. So should they be charged the on-campus cost, or they could show up online uh, all the time? Should they be charged the online course? In some campuses, the online course costs more. In some cases, yeah, the face-to-face -face course costs more. So I don't have a solution for that. I just know that it's uh, it's one of those administrative things that has to be kind of worked through. Which is why why in a campus like that, even when you as an individual faculty would want to start to do this, there's still an administrative implementation factor that has to be. Uh, reckoned with, and someone else has to help work through this, uh, not just scheduling, but also on the on the fee structure. Uh, if anyone out there is doing it differentially and has a solution, I think it would be great to offer that because I can't offer, uh, you know, the the best solution for everyone. It just um, it, I acknowledge the issue. Well, thank you for doing that, um, and that's uh, um, that's a really good question. And it's one that I think we'll be working through uh, this year, especially with some student pressure. We have uh, another video question coming in from uh, Peter Wallace, uh, University of Wisconsin, I believe. Um, let's see. Hello, Peter. UW Continuum, right? I'll give him a second here. Oh, may have a connection issue. Hello, that Peter. Moving, moving now, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Brian and Brian. Thanks so much for having me up. Um, University of Washington, actually. Um, I'm in Seattle. And uh, we're seeing significant interest in high flex. The issue, as I really appreciate you outlining earlier, is that teachers in a lot of these cases don't have time to, uh, to really learn um, how to do it particularly well. And it's resulting in potential uh, inequities between teachers and between students. And one of the biggest challenges I've seen is is kind of that balancing uh, engagement and particularly active learning between the in-class and the online sessions. Any recommendations, anything you've seen done particularly well, especially where uh, kind of doing active learning in class, online, plus the online asynchronous, I, I think that's one of the really tricky things to design. And we're trying to come up with the short list of tips that someone who kind of feels like they are thrown into this due to the current circumstances can can jump in and do um, without, you know, without uh, having to learn uh, the full possibilities mm -hmm. right off the bat. Thank you. Right. That's a great question. I think, I think you know, the, the way I address this uh, uh, with my own teaching is where I'll start from because I know that best. Uh, is by designing uh, an interactive online experience, asynchronous experience, which includes discussions, but also includes other kinds of activities like, uh, you know, working through a, a sample, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, whatever, whatever it might be. But you have them do something and art create an artifact and post it and then and then use it in a discussion form like to, to comment on each other. And so that can be interactive. I mean, that is interactive. It's especially around the content and you can build interactivity around that for the social aspects as well as well as the teacher kind of presence aspects of that. And so if that solution is is good enough, then what I'll often do is I'm, I'm doing a similar activity in the class is I'll have the classroom students when they're done with the activity, we're creating some sort of artifact that then contributes to that a activity for the asynchronous students who are usually come in later in the week, right? So if, if we're, if we're, if we're, you know, doing some, maybe we're doing a draft of something, you know, a list of things that are important or whatever it happens to be. We do a report out in class, but that report often is also captured in some way. It could be a document, it could be a, a video recording or something like that. That's there for the asynchronous students as well. It's not live. It's not as interactive clearly, um, but it helps them reach those learning outcomes. The challenge I find uh, is, was finding the time to dedicate to the interaction with students throughout the week because my workflow as a faculty used to be prepare for class, go to class, do class. And if I didn't have an assignment they were turning in that needed feedback, okay, I don't have to think about this for a few days until I wanna make sure I'm prepared for class, you know, for the next time it met, usually the next week. 
what I've done is I've, I've taken some time out of my face-to-face -face class and said, I, all of you, it, it's going to be good for all of us to use these asynchronous forums and some of that interactivity through this. And so what I would do is say, well, part of the time that's dedicated in class is going to be for participation in the, the other the discussion forum. So you can sit here and do it now. You can walk away, you know, 30 minutes early and then do it on your own time, but it has to be done as part of what's expected as part of your class participation. What that's done is that created a much richer asynchronous online experience, especially in a small class, 20 to 25 students. If I had most of the students in class in person, there might only be five people trying to do an asynchronous discussion. Uh, not likely to be very interactive, possible, but not likely. Now that I have all 20 or 25 in the asynchronous discussion, it's much more worth I feel a lot more value in the whole thing as an as a as an activity for students. And so what I do is I just kind of take, okay, 30 minutes, three times a week, dedicate that time in my calendar to interact in this particular forum for that particular class. Um, I find that, you know, it it took so I'm, I'm I'm shifting what I'm doing during the week, not necessarily doing more. So when I'm doing that in the forum, well, there are some other things I'm probably not doing as much. Uh, it might be, you know, administrative email or other kinds of things. You know, you have to find that 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 whole balance, but it's really it's been really from from me more of a a workflow change as opposed to a workload increase. When I first started this, it was obviously it was a workload increase because I think I didn't get what I was getting into, uh, and then when I especially when I shifted all the students in that mode, I found that boy, these people are really engaging in these incredibly complex conversations, and I I find that I don't I don't have to do a lot of facilitation. Uh, I have to, I, I watch and I read, and then I add my comments where they're helpful, but they're learning skills and kind of facilitating their own discussions on there, which is really, really rewarding as a faculty member to see. Thank you, and that makes me think about, it's not a high flex class, but a class that I was working with uh, where a biology teacher was actually uh, writing a open, edu uh, open textbook for uh, uh, endocrinology mm -hmm. textbook uh, with her class, and, and very similarly, right, okay, this is the class time that we're going to spend in group work writing these chapters, then she actually had more evaluation done by her students. So some of that feedback was coming from other students for right. exactly the reasons that you say, right? That just the amount of time that you have to spend on feedback doing that. So, right. Yeah. And, yeah. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thousand or a million great ideas out there. I mean, one of the nice things about being a teacher clearly is the ability to be creative and to engage. When I invite students to the creative process, you know, help them kind of shape topics maybe a little bit, but they become less producers and consumers of content. Wow, it just becomes a pretty amazing um, experience for all of us. Thanks Thank for the you. question. Thank you, Thank you for the great question. And uh, Peter, you'll notice, uh, gave us the uh, principle that only bearded people can be up here on stage. <laughs> but actually we have, uh, and, and Brian, thank you for this question. Your workshops must just be fantastic. We have time for one last question. And this is uh, Daniel Timmerman coming to us from uh, Denison in Ohio. Hello, Daniel. Hi. Um, so I'll, I know we're near the end, so I'll keep it brief. So uh, I work in educational technology, and often I only have you know a few minutes with a professor, and usually it's stressful because we're trying to do something with the technology. But um, sometimes I notice them not really engaging the remote students as well, sort of that second class um, thing we were talking about. When you only have a minute or two, to just squeeze in some suggestions on just better engaging the class, what would you bring up? Yeah, well, when uh, when a lot of us, uh, I, I mean, I, I came into higher education from a K-12 background. So when I was learning how to teach in, in high school, one of the things that we learned in classroom management was to have a, have, a, have a way to make sure you're calling on everybody and engaging everybody in the class. So you're not what we would call teaching to the T, the people in the front row or the people in the middle right in front of you. Mm -hmm. And so, so finding ways to kind of structure that so you would keep track somewhat, uh, however it might be. And I find that uh, that's useful for me also in the online environment to have my a, a roster that I can kind of check off on, okay, you know, this person has contributed to the conversation or not. So if the faculty cares about that, that's an easy way to make sure that's happening, uh, to kind of keep track of that. And just whatever is the easiest way for the faculty to do that. I think one of the challenges comes in when, when faculty aren't used to thinking that way. Because in, in the past, maybe it's a rel maybe they teach relatively small classes or it's a large class, and so they're not going to be a lot of interaction. And they're just doing the natural flow, who's, who's got my attention, right? Uh, so that would be, a, that there's a shift of uh, perspective there that, that might be needed. I don't know, you're not going to make that happen. Uh, now, the other thing that is sometimes helpful is have students raise the issue. 
mm-hmm. the faculty. And if, if, if you see that happening and, and you don't sense that the faculty is kind of likely to be able to respond to you know, intentionally, proactively doing this, it's mm-hmm. possible they would be able to react to student feedback uh, that's saying, hey, you, you know what, I feel like I'm not part of your class here. If there's a way to kind of engender that, not, you know, being in a technology support area, I don't know what access you would have to faculty that way or to students that way. But that's another way to get faculty to change their perspective is when their students start telling them this is a problem. Um, you know, we need you to fix this. Uh, and it's within their realm of their their ability and their their range of responsibility to do so. I find that it's another another powerful path for faculty change. All right, great, thank you, Daniel. Thank you for the question, and please say hi for me to all the good folks at Denison. I oh, will do. Uh, Brian, um, I have to say the opposite of hi right now. Um, th- this hour has just somehow flown by at uh, hyperspeed. I'm not quite sure how that happened, but. Uh, You've, you've been fantastic. You've, you've answered all these questions with just uh, such a plum and richness. I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for the opportunity. I always appreciate talking about this and hearing the good stories of things out there too. So uh, sure. and not just the kind of the negative stuff in the press. <laughs> well, I hear that. Well, well friends, what I, what I may just do is, uh, I, because we have so many questions, I may just copy these uh, all out into a text file and then put it on my blog and then add the recording. Uh, we'll have to do that tonight and tomorrow to the blog so uh, we can keep the conversation going. Um, uh, just thank you, um, Brian, um, and all best, uh, all best. You're, you're, a, a, you're a hero in these times. You've got a lot to do, and we're, we're really grateful for you being here. Thanks. Thanks for what you do, Brian, also. This is a really excellent forum. Oh, it's great people. My pleasure. But don't go away, friends. I'm um, going to point out a couple of uh, news items for the next uh, for the next uh, few weeks. And uh, let me just thank you all for these fantastic questions. Uh, these are really rich, both practical and cerebral. Uh, really, really good at eliciting fantastic discussion. Thank you. Uh, for the next two months, we've got a whole bunch of other topics coming up, including faculty of color, augmented reality, virtual reality, extended reality, the work-life COVID balance, accrediting agencies, and admissions. And on top of that, we have, of course, social media all over the place. Just use the hashtag FTTE if you'd like to say more. If you want to dive back into the past, we have a ton right now, about 223 uh, recordings. And they include uh, Professor Beatty's first session with us, as well as sessions on other topics that we've addressed today. Just go to tinyworld.com slash FTF archive. Um, and in the meantime, um, Thank you all for coming. Uh, this has been a really, really rich session. I'm really grateful to all of you for everything you contributed. Um, please, everyone, this is a bizarre and extraordinary semester. Uh, I admire all of you uh, for your creativity, your passion, your interest, your flexibility, and your hard work. Take care of all of yourselves. Stay safe, above all. And we'll see you online next time. Bye-bye.